we get to hear from another person who uh, uh, works at the height of power. Uh, although he hasn't been there, he hasn't been there long. Uh, uh, Dave Wright, he's one actually of the few congressmen that I've known before he was uh, a member of, of Congress. He's got a PhD in economics, which is, which is how I know <laughs> him. Um, even though I have a PhD in economics and I'm, I'm proud of it, it's not, uh, it's not always the case that I'm happy when a PhD economist goes to, goes to Congress. Uh, not all PhD economists are, are alike. Uh, fortunately, this PhD economist genuinely knows economics, uh, <laughs> unlike some other PhD economists, some of whom even have Nobel Prizes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Representative Bratt uh, was on the economics faculty at Randolph-Macon College, uh, where he served also as the as a department uh, chairman. He was the BB&T professor of the moral foundations of capitalism, uh, and uh, as you know, he was uh, e elected in a, a, a surprising and wonderful upset uh, in this past election cycle. Representative Bratt. Well, that was a nice intro. Thank you for that. Actually, I'm, I, I think the economist economist is here. I'm kind of a teacher, and I'm, I'm proud of that record. I went to seminary before I did the economics, so I've led an interesting life of trying to put those two realms together, and somehow it ended up in this new job. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's good. Uh, how many in this room are under 30 years old? Raise your hand. Very good. It's good. To, it's good. It's good. Uh, well, I was going to get to you guys. How many feel like you're still 30? That's, there you go. That's, that's, uh, I'll include you all in. Well, I always write out these comments, and then uh, I see the room, and sometimes they fit, and sometimes they don't. And so I think you guys have been in the weeds on you know this entrepreneurial free market stuff and what we got to do to get the economy moving again. So I'll kind of go through some remarks just to set things up, and I'm happy to take questions at the end, which I think you might be more interested in, in, in that than some congressman going through some you know, economic theory or whatever. But uh, I'll just start off with a few remarks I heard over here on the million regs and all this kind of stuff. Just I'll give you the political side of this thing. So I write these comments, and I had some one of these lists the other day. You know, Cruz or Rand Paul had the four and a half foot stack of regs, and so I, I said some remark about a million regs and 600,000 pages of something. I can't remember what the number was. And then PolitiFact comes after me and fact checks me and says, actually, no, there's calendars in the back of that, so you can't count all those pages. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, I mean, you think you got it bad as an academic with footnotes and whatever. You can't. It, it, it's so political. You cannot make yeah. up. And, and that's dead serious. What else? On the budget committee, we're talking about economic growth, and the other day we got the new head of CBO, and so uh, we welcomed him, and we had all sorts of questions, and there's always the ranking member on the Democrat side infuriates me on all sorts of fronts, and he, he was talking about immigration and whatever, and my ears always probably, that was never a huge issue for me in, until I started getting into politics and up here, and it, I, I get more upset about the untruthful claims than about the underlying policy issues. But, you know, he's got the CBO director. He says, uh, you know, it's, it's true. Immigration will cause economic growth. And so he, the CBO guys have got to be objective and fair and whatever. So he says, yes, uh, it'll cause growth. And so then when he's done, I get my five minutes. So I said, I said, I, of course it does. If you bring someone to, across the border, you add another worker to an economy, of course, GDP grows, right? And I said, but this is just fascinating to me as an economist. I said, then, I mean, surely we've, should want to import 7 billion people into this country and we'll grow like crazy. And the old, this was the old CBO director, and he, he looks at me and goes, that's an interesting thought experiment. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> and so you guys can, this is all humor. You guys can laugh. This is <laughs> Right, so this is what I'm dealing with. On, 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 so I asked the CBO director, the old one and the new, I said, uh, is it true in economics most people care more about uh, per capita income than they do about the size of an economy? Right? They said, yeah, we'd be right. said, would it be fair to say people also care about per capita income after taxes and transfers? He said, yes, that would be true. And I said, would it be tr tr fair to say, you know, that the average stats on the immigration, folks come across the, the border, whatever, the ninth or tenth grade education. I went to seminary. They're all children of God. That's not the issue. And uh, maybe make 20000 a year. Uh, they'll pay very little federal income tax. 
maybe get a little back from the earned income tax credit. And then one of the things I learned up here that's very important for you policy people is, you know, the uh, CBO scoring and all that. They don't include state and local costs. So someone comes, 20 grand a year they make, uh, they got two kids in public school, what's that? 24 grand, right? So you're net negative before getting into anything complex, right? So it just amazes me up here. I'm mean, just the simplicity of the argument, and our side is losing some of this stuff. Just in our, by our side, I mean the truth. I mean, it never hurts to start with the truth. And, and another example on the budget committee this week, and I'll get into some more focused talks, but I heard all these comments. They triggered all sorts of excitement in my brain. So they asked about the Republican budget. They, the ranking member uh, from Maryland, what's his name, uh, Van Hollen, he always gets me excited. So he's, he says, he says, well, isn't it true that the Republican uh, budget will slow uh, economic growth? And the CBO, uh, yes, that's, that's true. That's the way we're scoring it. And, and so he explained, well, you know, the Republican budget will, you know, shrink government spending, and that'll shrink aggregate demand, and so that'll shrink economic growth. So I got my question. I said, well, you know, just to be fair and balanced – I said, would it be true that if we took out another $4 trillion in debt this year and gave everyone teaspoons to dig ditches, like Milton Friedman taught us you know, a few years ago, and then we filled back in those ditches with the dirt you just dug out, that that would greatly enhance economic growth? And he said, yes, that is true, sir. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I mean, you just can't make it up. And so these guys are in the weeds, but when up here we're debating at the crudest level. Right? And so anything you can all do to help us just stay on track on the crudest level – and, you know, you're all talking about passing stuff through the House or through the Congress or whatever. And these are very distinct bodies. Right? I mean, I've only been here for four or five months. But you might be able to get some of this through the House. The Senate is basically an incumbent protection racket, right? I mean, they have that thing designed to a T. So they get to stay in for six and then another six. So they never vote on anything. I mean, it's set up so they avoid risk. And then the president right now. And that's right, can end everything and will end everything you're talking about. And so you come in, and then I got, you know, grassroots folks, free market folks back home. And then I go back now to the town halls, and they say, Well, why haven't you solved the problems yet, Dave? <laughs> I'm like, Well, I'm working on it, right? And, and so <laughs> you don't want to make excuses and blame it on the Senate or the president or whatever, right? But it is reality land. And so uh, you all can help us. And I'll, I'll get to some remarks on, on some of that to, as to how you can help us. The, the crony capitalism stuff is in the air. And the businesses, right, you said the businesses, there used to be, you know, only a, a few lobbyists, and now it's just packed. And part of the sad reality, in my stump speech, I used to say, you know, 50 years ago, the, the saying was, as IBM goes, so the country goes. Or no, as General Motors goes, right, so the country goes. And the, the business titans would align their economic interests with the best interests of the country to some extent, right? No one's angels, right? But they were all somewhat concerned with keeping GDP growth and all. And today, that's not true, right? I think that's a fundamental change uh, to the extent that some of the CEOs are actually scared of their federal government, right? Uh, the insurance folks, the hospital folks, Obamacare passing. I mean, they were walking on the sidewalk. I remember watching the news, and they were looking at their shoes, right? The film crews were on them. These are the most powerful people in the world, and they're looking at their shoes going to the White House for the signing ceremony on this thing, and they're too scared to speak out. And so I think one of the roles of uh, you public policy folks is uh, to spread the power evenly. Right? If they can be shamed one way, uh, put them on record out in public on the other, on the other hand, right? And you can go out follow the money, right? Go out to the uh, – whatever you call it, what's the Virginia Public Access Project, VPAP or whatever, and you all have the equivalents in whatever state you're in, right? But go follow the money flows and report on that, right? If, if someone's given to a certain politician and they don't give to another politician, I have me in mind when I'm telling you these stories, by the way, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? If they used to give to certain politicians and they don't give to other politicians who are free market and for rule of law and transparency, what conclusion are you left with? Right? What were they getting before that they're not getting now? And that's a story, right? And there's that, it's, it's almost a great blind experiment, right? You can just go look at the politicians who were getting money under certain regimes. It changes, right? There you go. And then they, they don't get money, 
from certain corporations and PACs and whatever. I mean, it's write it up because it's sitting there. All right, those are my introductory remarks that I didn't even mean to make. So <laughs> I'll just whiz through a bunch of the things you already know. That's what I, I didn't want to do, right? Result of too much government regulation. You guys have put together the book. Uh, U.S. is tied for 12th place in the world now uh, compared to number two in 2000. And I started teaching in 96. And so I've seen that. I'm amazed we're not lower than that when you factor in everything. Unemployment, people leaving the workforce. I'm just rattling off the stuff that goes through my world every day. Food stamps, 46 million people. Uh, the other political party, that's a badge of honor that we're helping this many people. And on our side, it's a, it's a badge we're hurting those people, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a Calvinist, right? You know, the old work ethic thing. I'm still one of those relics. I actually believe work is good for people's soul, et cetera. I mean, it's a kind of passe, but... <laughs> I still think it's true. Average family income's down. That's the big story, right? This, the far right meeting the far left with Senator Warren and all that kind of, that's, that's on that, right? The average folks are not doing well. And uh, so I got some stories coming up on that. Uh, since 2008, business closures in America outpaced startups. Gallup, 400,000 new businesses started annually, 470,000 closing annually, right? So 400,000 starting, 470, this is one poll. Before 2008, startups outpaced closures by 100,000. And then I'll just get to my biggest talking point. Uh, the other day in budget committee, in every talk I go to, I usually have printouts, and I put this graph up. It's a CBO graph. But this thing is the doozy, right? So when you talk about the burden we're putting on uh, businesses and whatever, it's just the, it's the uh, unfunded liabilities, right? So all the kids and everybody knows we're throwing $18 trillion in debt on your back. Uh, but the story is way worse than that. That's not the big number, right? Go down to the bottom of the debt clock, and it's the unfunded liabilities that are in law, and roughly speaking, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, Bush Prescription Drug Plan, and then you throw in interest costs. Those are all the auto pay programs, right? And so those are $127 trillion. Well, you say that to undergrads, which I did for 18 years, and they, you know, what's for lunch? You know, what, what's next? <laughs> right? The number's so big. But up here, I mean, it is shocking. And no one, CEOs, they just roll their eyes at this. And so I, I spend some time going over this. What's, what's that number mean? Well, on, on this graph, by 2032, those four programs and interest payments will consume all federal revenues. Everybody with me on that? So by 2032, in law. So I'm on the bid budget committee. We can't change this, right? So right now we have discretionary is about one-third of the budget. The auto stuff, the non-discretionary is two-thirds. So by 2032, what's going to happen? The two-thirds grows to 100% of revenues. So no revenues. So the governor of Virginia came up a couple of weeks ago, uh, brought his cabinet, all the secretaries, usual story. Hey, we need more money. We need help. We need support, right? That's all you hear up here, right? We need no support. And they're all goods, right? I mean, they're not economic bads. They're goods. People like this stuff, right? So they need secretary of transportation. We need more money for roads. We don't have an ongoing long-term road funding stream. True. We need money for education. We can get into that forever, right? That, that one would take up the hour. We need more money for health care. Medicaid expansion, think about that, Dave. All this kind of stuff. And then finally, uh, sequester is killing the military, right? Uh, business and professional services, a huge category. Of the Virginia economy is getting decimated up in northern Virginia. True. That's a true statement. And I said, uh, but... Uh, if you think that's a major problem, uh, you're wrong, right? That sequestration thing is a teaspoon-sized problem in comparison with this. I said in 16 years, how old are you guys? What, 20? Add 16. You're 36 years old, right? When you're 36 years old, there's no revenues left for the military. Zero. Right? I know there's some libertarians in here. I'm a little more hawkish than some of my libertarian friends. But it, I, it's a problem, right? No money for transportation, education, all these kind of things. No one has absorbed this yet, right? And you have to change the law. And I just went over a review on that, right? The House may have a few people willing to talk about it. A few. The Senate is hiding under their desk. 
In the White House currently, no way, right? It'll be a veto before you even start talking. And so that makes it hard on your brain. You know, do you sink your, if you're a freshman up here, do you sink your life work into that issue? Or do you go for small ball incremental stuff instead? And so that's hard. But right, this, this problem will consume every other problem you're going to talk about. If you don't readjust and reform the entitlement programs, the health care spending piece, all the rest is just teeny in comparison. And so you got to get the Republicans and the Democrats in the same room. And boy, that's going to be, it's going to be hard to do. Or wait for another financial crisis and all that kind of thing. Right? So that's, that's the big, yeah, I usually spend a lot of time on that one. Uh, I was supposed to get to some good news on something. <laughs> so what am, what am I doing? What, what are we looking at in terms of solving, uh, solving problems? I put in a balanced budget amendment. Some of you will yawn, oh God, not another one of those. <laughs> but I got some good rational staff over here. So we just did a one-pager, uh, no poison pills, no restrictions, no nothing. Just a one-pager, the only thing that we're firm on <clears throat> is that we got to come to balance within 10 years. That's it, right? So you're trying to get the Democrats on board. I'm going to go kind of Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. Right on the, you get people to sign up to throw your bill in and support it. And I, I think we'll be able to. I've been asking on the other side, and they, they're open, right? So I just say, hey, just acknowledge, this doesn't pay down any debt, right? This is just getting to balance in one year in the next 10 years. That's it. I said, surely you have to agree that we can come to balance in 10 years, right? And everybody thinks the deficits are going down. They have been from a trillion to now it's like only 500 billion, thank God, right? So that's good news. And then, but it's slated to go back up to a trillion by 2025. So that, that's where we are, and that's on your generation. And by the way, I tell every young crew I see, there's big money you can make up here. I hate to incentivize your life this way because I went to seminary, but... You can make big money up here, and you should, right? This is Madisonian, so it's kind of ethical, right? Form a faction, right? You need a faction up here that represents you, young people. AARP, they're doing a good job. You young people, get up here, have every kid in the country send you 10 bucks. You can pay yourself 200000 a year. You're golden, right? So there's your sellout, <laughs> right? Just start young. You'll be doing something morally good. What you do with your own money, give it to the poor or something, right? But you can get loaded if you choose, and you'll be doing the country. And you, I, I think this is a serious idea. I think you could be successful at it. All right, so what are we doing? Uh, cutting spending, GAO, you know, duplication of spending, $45 billion a year. Cato, co corporate welfare is at $92 billion a year. Uh, Coburn's annual waste book. We got Export-Import Bank coming up. Vote next week or in two weeks. They've been trying to tie that to everything. They were tying that to the trade bill on the Senate side a little bit. They've been trying to find a way to get that through. The Senate votes are there. Unbelievable. Right? And so you can guess my vote on that one. No. Uh, lower corporate tax rates. That seems like a no-brainer. You're talking about uh, tech startups and all this kind of thing. I talked to a real smart guy the other day in, in Charlottesville. There's, you know, we got a trillion bucks overseas. We'd like to bring it back. He's got some ideas about trying to take that money and write a bill to put it into startups. But it is amazing, and I heard a story the other day, is Russia has some $250 billion guy that is coming over here looking for opportunities, and it's not clear whether they're here, right? Whether the rate of return for the smart business guys, whether they can identify projects that have a rate of return. And so money, there's money sitting there. And so if you guys can help us, how do, how do you solve that problem, right? And then who picks? So say you got a free market you know, group of friends, how would you allocate huge pieces of capital, right, through the university system, right? And he, he was saying that he was the guy who can help, you know, UVA fund things. As you said, instead of giving to the endowment, give it to these angel startups th run through UVA. And the success stories, the money, a certain percent, goes to UVA endowment, right? So you can incentivize it that way. And so, I mean, just uh, cool ideas. But y in academia, you guys are the ones who can help solve this kind of stuff. The corporate thing, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world, but the politics of it is complex. And I'll, boy, I've run into it. I ran into it a year ago in the summer, and I did not know some of these things, right? And when you 
step on somebody's toes, they let you know in this business, <laughs> right? So the corporate rate, 35 down to 25, right? So that's the C corps. If you do that, then you got to do the S corps, to be fair, right? So those are the small businesses, pass through income to their, so you got to do that. If you do that, then you've taken care of the corporate and the, the capitalists, right? So then you better take care of the average person on their income tax side. So that's all even. And if you do that and flatten that, then you're going to run into the doozies, right? The home mortgage, the charitable contributions, the insurance industry, uh, the realtors all came, right, with concerns because they got long-term products. And so you start off with something that's simple with a C Corp, and by the end, by the time you do what you're going to do to make it fair, you're in some hard politics. And very few people are willing to make kind of this small sacrifices, right, for the greater GDP growth thing. Very few are thinking in those terms. How much time do I have? I'm going to ramble on forever. Uh, just take a few more minutes. A couple minutes, wrap it up. A couple questions and we hope. To Good. All right, right. Repeal Obamacare. We might get our wish on that one. Wait till you see what the Republicans do in response, though. <laughs> right? That'll be, that'll be a, a tricky one. Uh, the House Freedom Caucus, I'm a member of that. that. Look that up. This is a pretty interesting group. Jim Jordan is kind of quarterbacking it. It's not a top-down thing. We all kind of get along, all, mostly free market people, constitution folks. And uh, so some of the members in that group, we used to get the name uh, the Hell No Caucus in the press. So we're trying to change the marketing. We're trying to be the group that gets leadership to yes, but on conservative principles. And so we're trying to move that way. So, we're, you know, the leadership will move heaven and earth on some – Corporate stuff, right? Uh, free trade agreements, these kind of things. But very little for the middle class, for the average guy back home. And so our group is trying to say, hey, corporate stuff's good, but let's do a little balance. You do one of those, then give us one, right? On some Obamacare relief, some tax reform relief, or something that appeals more across the board. Uh, I'll just leave you with some good news. I usually end my talks, and it's the irony of ironies. I taught third world economic development for 20 years at Randolph Megan, 18 years, developing country stuff. And when I got there, uh, the Chinese and the Indians were making about a thousand bucks a year per capita. Chinese are now up to about $10,000 a year per capita, right? So there's our free market system and why, right? I mean, they're, they're going from centrally planned, you know, they haven't achieved utopia yet, but they're moving in the free market direction. And they've lifted, you know, roughly two and a half billion people out of total misery into a positive, right, future. And at the same time, the United States of America is doing what? A million pa pages of regs, one and a half trillion dollar impact on our economy, slowing it down. We shrunk last quarter. I hope it's not a sign of more to come, but I'm fearful. Right? And so, I mean, the evidence at just the simple level, we have the right message. Kurt and I were joking on the way over here. Right? I, should, I was going to open up with that, too, but I forgot to. Right? <laughs> I mean, it, it is a, we've won the debate. Right? The problem is the incentives, the economic incentives, are set up for a lot of folks not to want to come aboard. Right? But the intellectual debate, I think, is won. There's, I haven't heard a serious philosopher on the other side ever mention since I've been here. Right? So we've won the intellectual debate. Now it's time to execute and sell to the public and get them on board and, and let them know. Right? Our, our, our vision has enhanced human welfare. Right? Economic growth didn't start till about 1800. And then you get the hockey stick. So all the evidence is on our side. The average person doesn't know any of this. Right? So I'll just leave you with that. That's a go sell it and uh, keep the vision going. And thank you for all the work you guys do here. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you.